Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the anatomy of the spinal cord and talk about the major structures that would normally be asked on a lab exam. All right, so pretty much with this, we're going to be looking at a cross-sectional view of the spinal cord. So whenever you see this sort of butterfly-looking thing, that's the best way I know to describe it, you know you're looking at the cross-section of the spinal cord. And as we go through this video, we'll learn how to distinguish the anterior part of the spinal cord from the posterior. Now, before we talk about the parts, the first thing I want you to notice is the orientation of the gray matter and the white matter. Remember that gray matter is really just the cell bodies of neurons, their dendrites, and any unmyelinated axons. The white matter, which is lighter in color, the white matter is myelinated axons. So in the spinal cord, the white matter is all on the outside. Okay? The butterfly-looking thing, which is in the center, this is actually the gray matter. Okay. So in the spinal cord, the white matter is external and the gray matter is internal. This is actually opposite that of the brain, which we'll actually talk about uh, later on in this playlist. In the brain, the white matter is actually on the inside, it's internal, and the gray matter is actually external. So in that respect, the spinal cord and brain are actually flipped. They're opposite one another. All right. Now the first thing we're going to talk about is the gray matter. And the gray matter is divided into what we call horns. We have an anterior horn, a lateral horn, and a posterior horn. Now, the posterior horn is the first one I want to talk about. The posterior horn actually is this one on the back side of the spinal cord. There's one over here. This one would actually be uh, the left posterior horn. This would actually be the right one. And what you'll notice about the posterior horn is it actually extends closer to the surface of the spinal cord. So here we have another look at the posterior horn. Here's actually the right one. This one is the left one. And notice that it does either extend all the way to the edge of the spinal cord or at least very close. Okay. In contrast, the anterior horns, we have the right one here and the left one here, uh, they don't extend as close to the exterior of the spinal cord, okay, as close to the edge. And so that's one method to distinguish anterior from posterior, is to look at the gray matter. So hopefully that makes sense. Now the other piece of gray matter is the lateral horn. And again, we have a left lateral horn and a right lateral horn. These are kind of small, and they pretty much just lie in between the posterior horn and the anterior horn on either side, okay? Now, sometimes when you're referring to this gray matter, uh, you'll see it written posterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, anterior gray horn. Um, you can throw the gray in the middle of that, but generally speaking, if you just call it posterior horn and so forth, it's assumed what you're talking about. Okay? They're the same thing. Now, let's talk about the white matter, which, remember, is the myelinated axons of the neurons in the spinal cord. And we have three regions. We have a posterior white column, we have an anterior white column and a lateral white column. Obviously, the posterior white columns are going to be in the back of the spinal cord. So this one right here, this area, is the right posterior white column. This would be the left posterior white column. Then we have the lateral white columns. Those are just on the lateral aspects of the spinal cord. So this one over here would be the right lateral white column. And then in the front, we have the anterior white column. This one would be the right anterior white column. This would be the left anterior white column. Okay. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention, here's another view of it, the white columns are also called funiculi, and singular would be funiculus. So over here, we would have called it before the right lateral white column, but we could also call it the right lateral funiculus. It's a little bit shorter than writing out white columns, so sometimes you'll see this terminology. Likewise, in the front here, this would actually be the ventral or anterior white column. We could also call it the right anterior funiculus. Okay? So when you see the term funiculus, you can more or less just re replace that with white column, and it means the same thing. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, we have two divisions of the halves of the spinal cord. There's one in the front and one in the back. The one in the front is the anterior median fissure, which separates the left and the right, 
uh, anterior white columns or anterior funiculi, as we've just called it. Okay. In the back, this one's smaller and thinner. It's called the posterior median sulcus. Remember, a sulcus is smaller than a fissure. And this one would separate the left and the right. Posterior white columns or posterior funiculi. Okay. And then right in the center of the gray matter of the spinal cord, we actually have the central canal. Okay. The central canal. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. Now we've talked about everything that's within the spinal cord, but we need to switch gears and talk about these things coming off of them, right? And it's actually a little bit better visible here in this picture, so I'm going to switch. So these yellow things that are coming off of the spinal cord in general are called spinal nerves, okay? There's a spinal nerve pretty much for every level of the spinal cord. So remember that there's um, eight cervical vertebra, we have 12 thoracic vertebra, five lumbar, and so on and so forth. And so if you're talking about the spinal nerve that comes off of, let's say, the first lumbar vertebra, or L1, it would be called the L1 spinal nerve. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And of course, we have a left and a right. And remember, since this part right here in the front is anterior, okay, that means we're looking at it from the patient's perspective. So over here is actually the left spinal nerve, and this one would be the right. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, you'll notice that with the spinal nerves, there's parts of it that originate on the anterior surface of the spinal cord, and there's some that appear to originate on the posterior surface, and then they join up. Okay, before they join up, these parts right here, so this right here and over here, these are actually called roots, okay? So this one in the front that's coming off, this would be the anterior root. And since anterior in humans is the same as ventral, we also call this the ventral root. So anterior root is the ventral root. So this one over here would be the right anterior root, okay? And if we wanted to be really specific, we might say, right anterior root of whichever level of the spinal cord it is, like C5, T3, something like that, okay? In the back, we have the dorsal or posterior root. So this one over here would be the left dorsal root or the left posterior root, all right? And what you'll notice about the posterior root is right before it joins up with the anterior root, there's an engorgement of the posterior root. This engorgement houses the cell bodies of uh, sensory neurons that are coming back to the spinal cord. And this bulge is called the dorsal root ganglion or the posterior root ganglion. Okay? And this large bulge is only on the posterior root. It is not on the anterior root. So that's another way that you can tell anterior from posterior. If you see this engorgement, you know that that has to be the posterior side. Okay, so that is the posterior root ganglion. Then what we see is these two roots, both the posterior root and the anterior root, meet up. And really, once they meet up, that's what we consider the spinal nerve. Okay, so once they meet up, it's the spinal nerve. And we see the spinal nerve is going to tra travel laterally from the spinal cord. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. But the spinal nerve doesn't just stay like that. So here's a spinal nerve right here. Okay, here's the spinal nerve. It doesn't just stay like that. It actually divides. Okay, and as you're going away from the spinal cord, when the spinal nerve divides, it's going to divide into an anterior or ventral part and also a posterior or dorsal part. And these parts that divide from the spinal nerve are called rami or singular ramus. Okay. The larger one, you can see this one is thicker. Okay, I'm kind of tracing it right here. This is the ventral or anterior ramus. Okay, uh, Remember, ramus is singular of rami. So this is the anterior ramus right here. The smaller one, which obviously goes to the back side, is the posterior ramus, also called the dorsal ramus. Okay, So if we track how these start at the spinal cord, we start with the roots. We have the anterior root and the posterior root. Now this is drawn a little bit inaccurately. This is supposed to be the dorsal or posterior root ganglion. It's really supposed to be on the posterior side. 
But the point is, when these two roots meet up, they form a spinal nerve, and then that's them collectively, and then the spinal nerve will then diverge into a smaller posterior ramus and a larger anterior ramus, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And so this one on this side would be the right anterior ramus. And if we wanted to be really specific, we might say the right anterior ramus of, let's say, the C6 vertebra. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. What you also might notice here is we have a chain of sympathetic nerve ganglia, and they're going to travel on the left and right sides of the spinal cord parallel to it. Okay, so if we extended the spinal cord upwards, we'd see these sympathetic chains going up and up and up and down and down and down on either side of the spinal cord. All right. And so what it turns out is that the anterior ramus can actually communicate with the sympathetic chain ganglia. And so these little short pathways right here where my mouse is that are connecting the anterior ramus to the sympathetic chain right here, these are called rami communicantes. Okay, rami communicantes because they come off of the spinal nerve, really the anterior part of it, so they're rami, but they communicate between the anterior ramus and the sympathetic chain. So they're called rami communicantes, right? And we see two of them right here connecting the anterior ramus to the sympathetic chain ganglion. We can see some other ones over here. Sometimes they're called sympathetic rami, but they're usually called rami communicantes because they're communicating between the anterior ramus and the sympathetic chain ganglion, okay? The last thing I want to cover with respect to the spinal cord is really just the layers. Um, first of all, let's talk about the deepest of the meninges. This is the pia mater, what you see in this dark gray right here. The pia mater remembers the deepest of the meninges and it directly makes contact with this spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. Superficial to the pia mater, we still have the arachnoid or the arachnoid mater. And then superficial that we have the spinal dura mater, okay? Now, we still have the same intermediate layers. We have an epidural space. We have a subdural space between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. And there's also a subarachnoid space between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. And just like in the case of the brain, the subarachnoid space is where cerebrospinal fluid is moving and circulating through the central nervous system. Okay. But the meninges that we have in the spinal cord are the exact same as what we see in the brain. Okay, So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the various pieces of the spinal cord. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.